What do I need tell you? <laughs> I tell you what, I don't know what we've done to get any better. Wow. That last song, uh, who wrote that? Brett, who wrote that last song? I don't know. I'm going to look at my machine. I was thinking maybe you did. No, sir. I wish. Yeah. It's about me. <laughs> Joseph Park. Oh, Joseph Park. Okay. Wow, awesome song. Yeah. Well, most of you are sitting here this morning expecting us to turn to First Corinthians. But we're not. I'm going to do a sidetrack on you this morning and uh, look at something else that I feel like is very appropriate for us this morning concerning uh, the things that we're going to be participating in. So uh, you'll just have to wait until we get together again before we go back to 1 Corinthians. But we're going to be looking today at uh, the two ordinances of the New Testament church. Uh, the New Testament reveals the fact that there are really two ordinances that have been given to the church. And they've been given as a command uh, from Jesus. And they were practiced in the first century church, uh, in the New Testament church, and uh, many churches have practiced these throughout the centuries. And uh, I think it'll be good to just look at this doctrinal message today so that, uh, because I know some of you don't have a long background in terms of, of church, and, uh, and this might be helpful for you to uh, get a handle on some of this that we're going to look at this morning. Now, when we talk about an ordinance, you might wonder, well, what is that? You know, if you're in the Navy, you probably think it was a gun or something. You know? <laughs> uh, we're not going to talk about guns this morning. Uh, when we use the term ordinance, uh, it's an established religious observance that is carried out in accordance with biblically prescribed procedure. Okay? So it, it's something that we do within the church. Uh, it's, it's prescribed in church. It has its, its birth uh, in terms of the New Testament, and it's something that Jesus wants us to do. Now, if you hadn't already figured out what these two are, they are baptism and the Lord's Supper. And uh, sometimes uh, the Lord's Supper is referred to by many people as communion. They're both the same thing. <clears throat> now, I've been preaching about 38 years, been in ministry about that long, and I cannot, to save me, remember ever having the Lord's Supper and baptismal service on the same day. <laughs> did, did you ever remember that? I never did either. And I, but it struck me this week, like, hey, why didn't you know? That's a good plan. Why not do that before? Uh, super church. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, and then for certain, never to have preached a sermon on the Lord's Supper and uh, and communion. I mean, uh, baptism and communion, and having baptism and communion on the same day. So this is a real first. And uh, like I say, I don't know why I hadn't done it before. It would be a great time to bring those in and do that teaching because uh, we're just participating in them. But uh, anyway, that's what we're going to be looking at. Now, both of these are acts of worship. Okay? They're not just meaningless things people do. They're both acts of worship. And what they are, they're also uh, an acting out of the Word of God an acting out of the truths of the gospel. It's almost like a play or a dramatization of the gospel message. And you'll see that as we talk about each one of these this morning. Now, it's important to realize that participating in water baptism, participating in communion, are not necessary or required or essential for anyone's salvation. The Bible is very clear about the fact that we can be saved only by faith in Christ and, uh, and it's something we have to receive and not something that we earn or deserve or anything of that nature. So, it's not required. Even though there are uh, groups that say it is required and you know, that we have to respect that in terms of uh, their interpretation of Scripture. But it's something that, that uh, I've looked into a lot through the years, and I just can't find anywhere in Scripture that it is required. Uh, there are others that will say that 
their church has the only ability of any church to baptize someone with their correct representative, and that's the only way you can be baptized. And when someone says that, then they're saying it's essential that you're baptized by them, by their people, in the name of their church, and that's the only way you can be baptized and or, and be saved. Then there are others that would that would teach and believe that uh, as the Lord's Supper is given out, that is a dispensing, a putting forth of salvation to the person who receives it by the church that's giving it. And they do the same with baptism. Again, making baptism essential uh, for salvation. And again, saying you got to have it done by our people and you got to have it done in our church. And then when you do that, you're receiving salvation. Now, I'm not trying to put anybody's position down, but I really, really seriously cannot find that in Scripture. Uh, being as open to it as possible, I just don't think that's what the Scripture teaches. It's sort of like the, the situation in which some people uh, baptize people before they're old enough to know right from wrong. Before they're old enough to make a decision to accept Christ themselves. And uh, this also is not biblical. Uh, we have no evidence in Scripture of anyone being uh, baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit that had that was not mature enough to recognize that they sinned, to recognize that their forgiveness was in the work of Jesus on the cross, and they turned from sin and reached out to that and received it as a free gift of God's grace. Now, with all of that said, it sounds like I'm downplaying baptism and downplaying the Lord's Supper. And uh, I'm not doing that at all. Because clearly in Scripture, we find that uh, all believers are encouraged, it's expected, and, and it's just part of what we do as Christians to participate in being water baptized if we have been saved by faith in Christ, and also participating in the Lord's Supper or communion if we've been saved uh, through faith in Christ. So even though they're not necessary and essential for salvation, they are important. They're important to the church. They're important to each uh, individual Christian as they participate in them. They're important to God because He instituted these things for us to, to really act out, as I said, or, or dramatize in our own lives and in the life of the church uh, the death, the burial, the resurrection, uh, uh, the cross, the shed blood, the broken body, all of those things that the Scripture teaches us concerning uh, Christ. So with that said, let's look at a couple of verses of Scripture here. Uh, first of all, uh, we'll look at baptism, the ordinance of baptism. And uh, I'd like to take you to uh, Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. We're going to look at verses 3 through 5. And then we'll go to Colossians 2.12. But right now, Romans 6, 3 through 5. He says, Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into His death? Therefore, we have been buried with Him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with Him in the likeness of His death, now listen to this, this is an awesome promise, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of His resurrection. Awesome. Awesome is right. Now look at Colossians chapter 2, verse 12. Here he says, Having been buried with Him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with Him through faith in the working of God, who raised Him from the dead. So we see here that in... Biblical baptism, which is done 
by immersion of the believer in water. That's the proper biblical method, and you'll see the reason for me saying that here in just a minute. But uh, in this baptismal uh, act, uh, the, the believer is immersed, and that believer in that immersion then is symbolizing or acting out what Jesus did in terms of His dying on the cross for our sins, then Him being buried in the, in the tomb for three days, and then on the third day being raised back to life and receiving uh, His resurrection body. Now, at the same time that it symbolizes that, it symbolizes the fact that the believer themselves has died to sin. They made a, a decision to say, I, I want to quit living the way I'm living. I, I'm putting this behind me. And they, they're dead to sin in their old ways of life. Now, does that mean that they are perfect sinless people at that point and, and with that decision? Absolutely not. We're still in these bodies of flesh and, uh, and, and we still slip and we still fall into sin. But it is a decision that we've made to say, I want to begin to overcome this in my life by the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, So, it's a saying, I'm dead to my old way of life. I am now spiritually brought into this union with Christ in which I am buried with Christ. As you go under the water, that's, that's what the Scripture is showing here. This spiritual situation which you're buried with Christ. And then when you come up out of the water, you have the, uh, the resurrection picture here. And just as it symbolized the resurrection of Christ, this also uh, speaks of the resurrection of the believer to a new life that has been created through the salvation experience. The Bible says that uh, we, we are, all things are new when we come to Christ. Um, we're a different person. Uh, everything about us is different. Our attitude is different. Our desires are different. Uh, everything about us is different. And uh, that's a process that we start on. Now, do we become, again, totally super Christian right after accepting Christ and being baptized? No, it's a process of growing and maturing, <laughs> learning the Scriptures, learning what God would have to say to us. Somebody want to just... Yeah, Arnold's done. Okay, good. Um, but it, it, it's something that, that, that is important in our lives and we need to experience that. Now, we go on here and we see that, that it is... Uh, a, a life-changing experience that we have uh, as we are created into this new creation and this new person uh, by accepting Christ. And then we show that by the acting out of the baptism. And the coming up out of the water is to rise and walk in an absolute new and different life as you become a, a faithful servant of Jesus Christ. Now, Go with me, if you would, to Matthew. I'll see another aspect of this. Matthew chapter 10, verse 32. Let's read 32 and 33. Matthew 10, 32 and 33. Now this is Jesus speaking here, and He says, Therefore, everyone who confesses Me before men I will also confess Him before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies Me before men, I will also deny Him before my Father who is in heaven. Now, we see in this passage of Scripture here that the baptism is truly the biblical, public confession and commitment of a person's life to Jesus Christ. Now, there, there are different ways that people in the church today make that kind of a commitment. You will hear preachers give invitations to, to come and profess Christ, and, and so people will probably come and they'll pray to be saved, and then they may share with somebody that they've been saved, or they may have them stand up and share something before the church. And all of that is a confession of Christ publicly, okay? But when you look at the Bible itself, the... the prescribed intended way to make it known to the world 
that you're now committed to Christ, you're saved, you're going to follow Him, that you're now uh, confessing Him before men is the act of water baptism. And so, when you look at that, you see that this comes as something then that's uh, not necessary for salvation, but yet something very, very important to be carried out in the church, very important to be carried out in the life of every person that has come to faith in Jesus Christ. Now, in the baptismal experience, we see that as a convert, as one who's a sinner coming into a right relationship uh, with Christ through faith in Him, then that believer then is identifying himself or herself with Jesus. And you can see that, okay, in, in all that He's done for us. You can see the aspect of the acting out of the dramatization of the Gospel message that's being presented. But it's also uh, just as much so uh, Jesus identifying with us as sinners when He was baptized. Now, a lot of times we don't think about that. But most of you are familiar with the situation in which John the Baptist came as a forerunner of Jesus. He was prophesied hundreds of years before He came uh, that He would come and He would be a forerunner of Jesus, of the Messiah. And, uh, and so John was led to begin to baptize people, to call them to repentance and... Uh, show that they had repented, they were to be baptized, and, uh, and he was to calling forth the Jews for that. Okay, And many of the people were going out and being baptized. Now, the interesting thing was, the religious leaders of the day were not going out and being baptized. But the run-of-the-mill Christian per, uh, Jewish person in that day, that was many of them looked down upon by the religious establishment, they were flocking out to to the place where uh, John the Baptist was baptizing. Now, when John, by the power of the Holy Spirit, showing him how he would know the Messiah and all of these things, when John was going to baptize Jesus, he didn't want to do it. But Jesus said, no, let, let this be done and uh, let this be fulfilled. And so what Jesus was doing in His being baptized, He was identifying Himself with us as sinners. Jesus didn't sin. He didn't need water baptism as showing that He had turned from His sin. Uh, John said, repent and know that the kingdom of God is at hand. I mean, here Jesus, He was the kingdom. I mean, He had the whole shooting match. So, He didn't do it for any of those reasons except to fulfill what He was supposed to fulfill, to be obedient to what He was supposed to do. And in so doing, He identified Himself as much as possible then with us as sinners. Because He did something that the people of that day as sinners were being called to do. <coughs> Yet, He was without sin. So you can see here in this how that uh, the, the baptism of a believer has several reasons for it. It has several ram ramifications. Uh, it's clear in Scripture that it's something that we, we should do. And again, there is no evidence whatsoever of baptizing someone and it having any power or effect upon their life if they were not old enough and mature enough to make a decision recognizing sin, choosing to turn from sin, believing that Jesus paid the price for their sins, and putting their whole hope of forgiveness and eternal life resting upon Jesus Christ and what He did on the cross. Uh, we, we, all, all too often, we as, as, as people uh, on this earth, we want to do it all ourselves. And this causes a lot of people to miss what Jesus has done. Jesus has done it for us. We can't do it for ourselves. We have to receive that from Him. And uh, I mentioned this the other day, but some of you have probably seen the bumper sticker. I, I really like it. It says, if you could have done this for yourself, Jesus would not have had to die. Now that's, that's good theology, and it's very simple. If we could do it for ourselves, if we could have our sins covered and be restored to right relationship with God ourselves, 
then it was foolish for God to say Jesus died on the cross. It was a waste of time. But that's not the case. It was not a waste of time. Uh, that message of the cross is the power of God unto salvation to all who believe, as we've been seeing in the book of 1 Corinthians. So, that's baptism. And we see it is important for every person that has placed faith and trust in, the, in Jesus to then follow Him in obedience in water baptism. And biblically, it is baptism by immersion. And you can see clearly the reason for that is because of the fact that pouring water on someone or sprinkling water on someone does not carry out the whole picture and the dramatization and the identification of baptism and what it means. you got to go under that water and come up out of that water to see this fulfilled. Now, the reason this came about that people sprinkled or poured water on people and all, it was by convenience. And, uh, you know, I mean, if you're dead of the winter and it was in the 1500s or 1600s or way back there when, when you didn't have churches with heated baptismal pools and all of that, uh, then you could see, I mean, here's somebody that's gotten saved and they want to be baptized and so, well, about the best we can do is just pour some water on their head and say a prayer or whatever. But the intention was probably okay in the heart of the people who started it. But the point is simply this. It's not the proper baptism. Uh, biblical baptism then is by uh, someone that's old enough to know what's going on to make a decision. And it is by immersion in water. Now, let's look at what the Scripture has to say about the ordinance of the Lord's Supper or as we said, uh, some people call a uh, communion. Look with me, if you would, to Matthew 26. Matthew chapter 26. We're going to look at verses 26 through 28. Matthew 26, beginning with verse 26. He says, while they were eating, Jesus took some bread. Now it's important to realize what is happening here. Jesus with His disciples is participating in uh, the, the Jewish activity of the Passover feast. Now, when the Jews were in bondage in Egypt, you know the story uh, of how they were released with the powerful miracles and, and all of those things. And finally, after the, the tenth miracle had taken place, the Pharaoh said, let them go. Okay? Now, what they were instructed to do was each family to kill a lamb. And they were put its blood over the doorpost of their house. And they were to have everything packed, their shoes on, sandals on their feet, and be ready to take off at any moment. And they were to roast every bit of the meat. And they were to eat that meat of the lamb. Now, this became something that was instituted in the Jewish church throughout all the generations of the, of the Jewish people. It was the Passover feast. And so you had a lamb that's blood was shed to release them out of bondage. And you had... A lamb whose meat was ingested into the people, which resulted, if you look at Scripture close enough, into the fact that some people say there was two million plus that left out of Egypt that night. And Psalms has something very interesting to say about that group. None of them were weak. None of them were feeble. None of them stumbled. In other words, there wasn't a sick one in their whole midst. We've got about 80 people here now. There's probably somebody sick in this group. <laughs> but to have 2 million plus people with no physical conditions, what we see from that is that their lives were saved by the blood. They were healed and strengthened by the Lamb. And, it, and, it's, and it's me. Now, Jesus is with His disciples. On the night before he was betrayed, just a few hours later, he would be betrayed. 
betrayed. Just a few hours later, He would hang on the cross. Now, He was with them doing this uh, Passover feast. And that's what He says here. While they were eating, Jesus took some bread. And after bless a blessing, He broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat. This is My body. And when He had taken a cup and given thanks, He gave it to them saying, Drink from it, all of you. For this is My blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the remission of sins. Now, what we see happening here is very important. Jesus was Jewish. His disciples were Jewish. It was the day to practice the, the, the yearly thing that they'd been doing for centuries of practicing and playing out what had happened to them when they were brought out of bondage in Egypt. The, the Feast of Passover. But notice what Jesus does. Jesus comes and He turns the whole thing upside down. And He turns it into the Lord's Supper or Communion. And then He goes forth and carries out every act in His own body and life, of what all of that was pointing toward all of those years. You see, God gave them that to remind them and to remind and teach the younger generations of how God had delivered them. But God's main purpose for the Passover feast was a prophetic proclamation of what He was going to do in the real Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, Jesus the Messiah. So, Jesus comes and what does He do? He goes to that cross, but before He goes to that cross, His body is beaten by a Roman soldier with 39 lashes. He lost enough blood and was made weak enough that He couldn't even carry uh, the timber for His cross all the way to where He would be crucified. Now, that is the whipping or the scourging that Matthew talks about in, I mean that Isaiah talks about in, in Isaiah 53. And he says something very important about that scourging. That Jesus did that for our physical healing. If you have any doubt as to whether it's physical healing as over against spiritual healing at that point, then just read Matthew chapter 8. And you will see that Jesus heals people physically and then turns around and quotes the fact that uh, he's done this to fulfill the prophecy of Isaiah that said in Isaiah, by his scourging we are healed. Okay? So, as they were healed by the body of the Lamb, Jesus, we're going to use the term in a minute from Scripture, body was broken for us. And I believe the thing that the church is that God wants to extend healing through the, the giving and the reception of the Lord's Supper. Now, on the other side of that, you have the blood. The blood of the Lamb in the Passover feast saved the lives of those people and let them be just, just driven out from their, their bondage that they've been in for 430 years or whatever it was. Now, when Jesus goes to the cross, he sheds blood, and clearly, as it is presented in the prophecy in Isaiah 53, that shedding of blood and His uh, dying on the cross for us is for the forgiveness of sins. So we have the carrying out of the Passover feast into the Lord's Supper. And that's exactly what He's saying uh, here that has happened. And so we see the body of Jesus and the blood of Jesus fulfills those two things in the Passover feast. The meat of the lamb and the blood over the doorpost. Do you see that? And so Jesus took what they had been doing for centuries and He turned it into the greater thing that God had in mind all along. He turned it into a remembrance of the, the, the body that was torn and broken of Jesus for our physical healing and the blood that was shed for the forgiveness of our sins. So, we see then that the, the Lord's Supper then is, is of great importance in that way. And the Lord's Supper then symbolizes, as did baptism, it has a symbolic thing as it's carried out, it symbolizes the death of Jesus on the cross. 
Uh, the bread then and the Lord's Supper, the, one of the elements becomes the broken body of Christ. The cup as it is referred to, the cup with the fruit of the vine becomes symbolic of the blood that was shed for the remission of sins. And so you have uh, just going along with each other the Old Testament Passover feast with its elements and practice and the Old and the New Testament uh, Lord's Supper and Communion and the elements that are in it. And uh, so for the believer now in Christ, there's no more participation necessary in the uh, Passover feast, but now it's all new. And it has the fulfillment that God wanted it to have all along. The, the proclamation of what God wants to do for His people through Jesus and through their faith in Him. He wants to heal us physically and He wants to heal us spiritually by allowing our sins to be washed away by the blood that Jesus shed. Now, all through the Old Testament, God was teaching us that the blood is life. The animal sacrifices was for the purpose of showing the people. You got sin. The law showed them that. He never intended for them to keep all the law because nobody could. So it was to show them you got sin, and then also to realize the fact that the only answer for man's sin is the shed blood of a perfect sacrifice. And Jesus is that perfect sacrifice. So, the cup then represents that uh, uh, shedding of blood. Now, let me say just a little bit about this. There's there, I use the term here, fruit of the vine, because that's what the Scripture speaks of. And uh, I don't want to offend anybody. I just want to try to be biblical again. That There are some people that will really argue the fact that the wine that Jesus made at the marriage ceremony in Cana was not really wine. It was just grape juice. And they will try to convince people that what is was taken here in that... In that uh, First Lord's Supper in the cup was not wine, it was just grape juice. And uh, that's really not true in Scripture. There are a lot of people that will argue that. But you have no basis of that teaching in Scripture. The wine Jesus made was good wine. The water turned into wine. Uh, what they drank was wine. What we will drink with Him when we drink it afresh and new with Him in heaven is going to be wine. So, why do some churches, as we will do today, why do some people use grape juice instead of wine? Well, it's still the fruit of the vine, and you have the situation in which I think many churches do not want to put anything before someone who may have an alcohol problem. Okay? Because, you know, you can say, okay, I'm just taking this for the Lord's Supper. But just a taste of it for some people could be something that would be a downfall for them. So, most churches, not all, use just the fruit of the vine as grape juice. I think either way is okay here. But, but don't try to make the Scripture say something it doesn't say. Okay? It was wine. And, uh, and Jesus said He wouldn't partake of it again until we're in the kingdom with Him and we're going to be at that marriage supper of the Lamb someday and... and that's what it's going to be in, in the cup, I'm certain. Now, so, as the believer then takes the elements, the two elements, the bread and the, and the uh, fruit of the vine, they memorialize or they honor the memory of Jesus' death on the cross. But more than that, as we'll see in the verse we're going to read in just a minute, uh, they are expressing the hope of the promised return of Jesus. Because we're going to see it in a minute. It says as long, whenever you do this, you're doing it until uh, in remembrance of Him until He returns. So you have, you see both of those. It's a memorializing and an honoring of Jesus' death on the cross. But it's also an acting out of a proclamation that Jesus is not dead. He's alive. And He's coming again. And He's coming again very soon. Much sooner than a lot of people would think, I would tend to believe. So, what we're going to have today then is the opportunity to participate in the two ordinances. And uh, 
for those of you who uh, have never been saved, you've never uh, came into a right relationship with God through faith in Christ, then you're going to be given an opportunity in a few minutes to do that. For those of you that have been saved and you've not as yet followed in water baptism, you're going to have the opportunity today to do that at 1 o'clock also. And uh, so I think this is all coming together pretty pretty neatly here. And uh, again, it is, it is something we're to do because we've been saved, not something we do because we, uh, in order to be saved. So, for those of you that have never given your life to Jesus, you could do that today. And you could be baptized this afternoon. What an awesome thing. And we're going to give you an opportunity to do that before we leave here today. There are several others of you that over the past few weeks have come to me and said, uh, I'm saved. I I've placed faith and trust in Christ, but I've just never followed in water baptism and I want to do that. I'm not sure how many we're going to have today. Uh, probably around 10 people or so have, have told me that. But I do know that some of them are out of town this weekend. So we'll have to catch them on another time. But uh, whoever we have today that's here, we're going to have that at 1 o'clock, and it's a great opportunity then uh, to do that. So uh, this, is, this is really what the church does to proclaim in an acted out form exactly what Jesus has done for us and what we do to proclaim what's happened within our own lives. So, before we get to the river, we'll do the Lord's Supper. Uh, you have in front of you a nice little, neat little thing here. This is good to use in bars and prisons. <laughs> I'm serious. Bars and prisons, somebody must have invented these things for that. If you peel off the first little tab, you get to the to the bread, and then the second little tab, you get to the fruit of the vine. And so you can do that as we get to each one appropriately in just a minute. Now, let's take just a moment uh, of, of prayer, just, just to solidly, quietly, uh, rest our hearts before God and, and prepare ourselves to take the Lord's Supper. Is there anyone that does not have a, a communion elements? Anyone? Okay. Let's uh, just pray for a moment and prepare ourselves to receive the Lord's Supper. Okay, there's one last scripture that I want to read. <coughs> I want to read from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and uh, first of all, verses 23 and 24. It says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which He was betrayed, took bread. And when He had given thanks, He broke it and said, This is My body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of Me, the body of Christ. Then verses 26 and 27. Excuse me, 20, let's begin with 25 and 26. In the same way He took the cup, also after supper saved, This cup is the new covenant in My blood. 
Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Now listen to verse 26. This is the one I made reference to a while ago as the fact that we're not only memorializing what Jesus has done, but we're proclaiming what He's going to do. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. But listen to this other part. You proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. The blood of Christ. Jesus has promised that He will come again for His church, His bride. And when you read Scripture and you read prophecy and you look at what's going on in the world, there's every reason in the world to believe that that is to be a very soon event. And when He comes, He will catch up and bring up into the air to meet Him in the air all of those who have been born again through faith in Jesus Christ. At the moment He comes, the saints that have already died as Christians, their, soul, their spirits are already with Him. When He comes, He will bring those spirits. He will resurrect their bodies from wherever they're buried, turn it into the resurrection body like His, join that spirit and soul back with it. But at the same time, every born-again believer that's alive when He comes, we will be changed, the Scripture says, like as quick as you can blink your eye and be given the resurrection body like Jesus has and go up and to meet Him uh, in, the, in the air. And then I like the last part of that in, in Thessalonians. It says, and so shall we forever be with the Lord. Amen. Now, if that's not exciting, I don't know what is. Now, what I want to do now is to give you an invitation. Uh, we're going to have a prayer team that's going to be over in this area at the close of the service. If you've never given your heart and life to Jesus, God loves you. He wants you to be His child. He wants to forgive all your sins. He wants to give you the assurance that you're forgiven and you have eternal life waiting ahead for you. And if you've never, if you've never come to Him in faith in that way, then I want to invite you to come up and let someone talk with you. They'll share any, answer any questions you might have. And they will pray with you, lead you in a prayer of acceptance of Christ. And you can be saved today, and you can go down and get baptized today, which is cool. Now, for those of you that, that you've already been saved, but you hadn't really made that decision to follow Jesus in water baptism, I guarantee you, you got plenty of time. As soon as we dismiss here, you run home and get your duds, and you got time to get down there and meet us at the river. This will be a great day for you to do that. A great day. Okay? Now, on the other side of that, if there are those of you that have prayer needs, I know some of you want to be prayed for for some physical healing. There, there may be relational needs, financial needs, spiritual needs, emotional needs, uh, whatever it might be. If you have something that you're wanting uh, God to, to work on in your life and you want to join with some other people and agree with you in prayer concerning that, then when we dismiss, I want to ask you to come up also. And you'll just come up over to this area over here where, where our prayer team is. Just go up and tell them, this is what I've come for, this is what I want prayer for. And, and they will minister to you in Jesus' name. If, and if everybody is busy, uh, just have a seat, wait, and, and, it, and if you're in that area, they'll finish with someone else, they'll get to you. Okay? So take advantage of this. Uh, this, this is powerful. It, it, it's good. It needs to happen. And there are people shaking their heads up and down been prayed for in the last few weeks. Okay? That's our message today. I hope that, that you, you got something today that was what God wanted you to receive from this. If you want to participate in the ministry of this church, we have our offering bucket here. And we do have lunch. If you want to stay and eat with us and visit with us, uh, then you can order and we can eat here. And uh, we'll be leaving at 1230. 
and uh, Kevin and Julie will lead us down to the baptismal service. And then after the baptismal service, Lorraine and Steve and I'm not sure who all else is going to be going on a ride out to Swan Lake if you'd like to go to that. Oh, uh, Swan Falls. Oh. Well, that, that's our message today. Thank you for being here. God bless you. You're dismissed.